Hello and welcome back to Guided Hacking, this is ForHK and today we're going to be taking a look at a piece of malware that was presumably written by a skid. While I was taking a look for some malware to write a video about, I came across this very high score out of 10 on triage, but without a config. So usually these kinds of detonations interest me because it means that the binary was doing something malicious, but triage doesn't know what it is yet. So they haven't made a config extract for it. So I scrolled through and I checked out some of the signatures and it has some good signatures such as grants admin privileges, downloads a file, modifies firewalls, does all kinds of malicious things. And then I went down to the process tree and you can see it starts with this file.exe, then it jumps to an ieexplorer.exe and just calls so many different processes to carry out all kinds of bullshit. And this made me really interested. I took a look at the networking and you can already see that it starts off with the grabbing an exe and touches all kinds of different PHP files. So it certainly isn't anything quiet or something that likes to do all of its traffic through one PHP file. I mean, the C2 here must contain at least 10 files. Anyway, Let's start off with the initial loader. So our infection chain starts off with this build3 file and it isn't much more than just a simple loader that we can get the final build of quite easily. Within the configuration, we can see that it's set to string, which is set to a temp path. It's got this URL, which we saw in the triage execution and we can see this iExplorer.exe. So to find out where these are used, I can just click on analyze, read by, and that'll be in the main function. And all it does is it just sets a hidden window, it sleeps for a while, sets some TLS settings, set the file name, and download the file and execute it with the process start. So we can go on to go ahead and download that exe that we see in the configuration here. And this is the main binary. I always find it interesting when looking at second stages to check the parent directory of that binary. And when I did it for that URL, we can see an open directory, which is quite common for not knowledgeable threat actors to leave things unprotected and open within their C2 servers. So here we can see all kinds of builds, all kinds of different loaders and testing that the developer of this is doing. But obviously I've just gone and downloaded that second stage so that we can take a look at it. When opening it up within DMSPY, there's all kinds of different functions. So we can start looking through this. It starts off with the call to if debugger is attached and if it is, then it will sleep and return. So this will just exit if a de debugger is attached. It'll enable visual style and then it just won't render anything so that the window isn't shown to the victim. It'll then get its current process and if it can't get its current process then it'll also exit and sleep after doing so. Once that's done it will request out to ipapi.com and get the JSON of the infected user and it'll do some comparisons there to this country list and this is some CIS countries and it's common like I've mentioned in other videos for Russian or other CIS individuals to make sure that their malware doesn't affect anybody within their home countries. So they'll put that in and if the country does match any of those, then it will exit. Going on, it'll then get this software Windows current version run. Now, if I take current version run and I look it up and just scroll down a little bit, we see persistence here. And that is a common registry key for malware to add themselves into the startup programs for a computer. So when the victim opens their computer, that'll be one of the first programs that runs. And that's one of the common keys. It's used by all kinds of different malware. And here is a list of some of them although there are all kinds of different methods for persistence. You see this, usually it may be malicious, but sometimes legitimate software uses it as well. Now, it'll go down, it'll get its location, and it'll set itself into that persistence location. And after that, it'll write line and we'll put some garbage into the console for the threat actor when they're testing this. So going on, we can see that there is all kinds of different strings here. What looks like base64 encoded strings, and those are put into a different function here. Looking into the function, we can see that it converts them from base64 and then gets the UTF-8 string. 
Now, I'm not going to put these all into CyberChef because you can do that. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a breakpoint here and I'm just going to debug and then step through all of these so I know what strings they are. But before that, here's a word from Guide Attacking. And stepping over these base64 calls and pulling up the local values, we can see what is in these strings. So looking through this, we get a current version system. So that's getting some information about the system. It's also getting consent prompt behavior admin and also zero. It'll also convert that from base64. And we can see within the returned data that it is returning the following a powershell string that calls command add mp preference exclusion path so what mp exclusion path is a method for malware to add itself to the exclusion list within windows defender and the malware here instead of just adding in itself it adds in the whole c hard drive so that nothing on that drive gets detected and this is very common for malware to do so that they don't have to worry about windows defender but if you see this it's quite clear that, that the program that's doing it is malicious going on it'll call fod helper afterwards to actually run that process of PowerShell and then add itself and everything else within the drive into the exclusions. It'll then delete a subkey tree within the registry to clean up its tracks. And now we go on to check what is a weird mutex that it does. It creates this mutex file here, checks if it exists, if it does exist, then it'll carry out some functionality. And then if it doesn't, it'll just continue on with the process. But because that file exists on my system, we skip over and we go into this function here. Now, this function here will call two functions, but the first throws a exception on my computer. The issue with it is because it's trying to extract information from my browsers. And each one of these is trying to grab information from my browsers. But I do not have all the browsers installed and they mishandle what happens if those browsers aren't available. So it'll just crash and the malware will stop running. If the malware successfully does collect all the information from the browsers, then it'll create a raw file and compress everything with the password of this. And that will be sent to the C2 that we saw within the triage execution. So now the execution of this malware stops because it's broken. There's also a very interesting feature that I haven't seen within this malware before. And this is within this function here. So it'll sleep, do a debug check. And then if there is a debugger, then it'll return and skip out. If not, it will write text of from the resources into a bat file. So we can go into the resources and we can actually dump that bat file by going here. And then we can take a look at the following. So this is a bat file that is within the resources of the malware. There's also two other pieces of information within the malware, but these are just used for the information stealing, which I don't find too interesting. Now, this bat file here basically is setting itself up so that the malware can create an RDP process and then tunnel that RDP process through Ngrok. And what Ngrok is, is it's a free to use tool that will allow you to run any process and then connect it out onto the internet through Ngrok. And this way you can stand up your server or just show it off and put it on Ngrok and that'll connect it out to the internet and do all the port forwarding and everything for you. So you don't have to worry about that, which makes it very useful for malware so that they can open certain services and not worry about having to do all the port forwarding and making sure that it's open to the wider internet. And that's exactly what this does here. It will set up that bat file, which will start the RDP. And then these base64 strings will just be setting a new user 
for the Windows system. So scrolling through some of this code, you can see that it downloads the file from that same open directory we looked at earlier of ngrok.exe, and then it'll write it to disk. If we scroll down, we can also see some command that will run ngrok.exe with the following auth token. So this will be the threat actors auth token for them to be able to use ngrok, and it will then open TCP on 3389. Uh, this auth token could be looked at more and could be possibly brought to the knowledge of ngrok so they can block it. Now, some of the other code within this malware will also add a user onto the system. And once the hidden RDP is added, which is that RDP, it will send that off to DC2. Looking further at the triage process, instead of reversing, we can just look at the method of running that bat file first. And then once that bat file is done, it will get some information about the system and then it will add black team with this to the users on the computer and then allow for them to use the RDP process down here. And it will also add that user to the administrators. And this is all allowing for a user, the threat actor, to log in with the black team user to an infected computer. And once that's all done, then as I previously mentioned, it will open up ngrok, it'll open up VHTTD, and then it will send to the C2 that it's opened all of the ports. I hope this was a good overview of some of the interesting functionality of this malware. Until the next one, thank you so much for watching. Goodbye. If you enjoyed this video, a like would help a lot and subscribe to be notified of future uploads. If you haven't already, check out guidedhacking.com for a step-by-step -step introduction to game hacking and an ever-growing catalogue of content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.